I attend, so um, I know that you guys couldn't make it onto Teams today, but I thought I would record a few um, things for Music for a While and Killer Queen. So this is the Music for a While lesson, um, and we're going to go over key features a bit like the um, other videos that I've done. So please make sure that you have all necessary equipment you will need a pen or a pencil and a notebook to make notes on. Um, ideally as well, if you've got it with you, you will have your GCSE music um, revision guide. So I'm going to go through a few slides at a time and then we're going to have a quiz. Make sure that you pause it if you need to um, to make notes, etc. So context. So Purcell um, was a very well known English composer during the Baroque period. Lots of his music was commissioned by patrons. Um, a patron was a wealthy person who paid for music to be written for them. Um, sometimes they had it dedicated to special people or a special occasion, um, and sometimes they just asked for a piece of music to be written. Um, the song was written by Purcell as incidental music for the play Oedipus. Incidental music is music written for a play to enhance the atmosphere. So you would have had the actors on the stage performing and then separate musicians performing the incidental music. The version of the play that included music for a while premiered in London in 1692. Um, music for a while is a da capo aria. A da capo aria is a musical form um, for arias that was prevalent in the Baroque era. So it's normally sung by a soloist with the accompaniment of instruments, which is normally a, a small orchestra. Um, and it's very common in opera and oratorio. The da capo part actually stands um, for the structure. Um, so it, it means head de capo um, and aria means song. So the first section, the A section, the head de capo um, is repeated. So we would know that as ternary form, ABA form, but because it's an aria, we call it a de capo aria. Um, the piece of music is a lament. Um, it's, a, it's a sorrowful song. Um, and in this particular part of Oedipus, um, two priests are summoning and calming the ghost Electo, um, who is a, a character in the play who has snakes for hair and eyes which are dripping with blood. Nice. So here are just some representations of what um, what uh, Lecto might have looked like. So on the left hand side you've got um, some paintings of what Alecto may have looked like. And on the right hand side, you've got um, a, I suppose, an advert um, of Oedipus, a tragedy, um, which is, is a poster for the, a performance at the Duke's Theatre. So I know quite a few of you might be wondering, well, I don't understand what Oedipus is. I don't even know the story. Um, I don't know the context of music for a while. So um, I'm just going to take you through a really, really quick version of um, the plot summary. So King Lyoth is told that his child will kill him and will take his wife. Um, what happens after that is um, the king leaves um, the child to die because he obviously doesn't want it to kill him. Then the baby's found and taken to another king, so a different king. The son, Oedipus, visits an oracle. An oracle is someone who um, predicts the future, a bit like a fortune teller. Um, and then the oracle tells Oedipus that he will kill his father and sleep with his mother. A bit weird. Um, Oedipus kills his biological father and unknowingly marries his biological mother. So he doesn't realise that he's married his actual mother. Um, so that's a bit, of, a bit of a plot twist. Then um, Laius's ghost is summoned to discover his killer. And this is what the two, um, the, the two priests are doing in music for a while is they are summoning um, the, the ghost um, so that they can discover his killer. So the king can discover his killer. He discovers that Oedipus killed him. Um, and Electo, 
um, who is the goddess who torments the guilty, um, she is, is cast because they now know who the killer was. And years later, the truth is uncovered. Oedipus's mother, Jocasta, kills herself and Oedipus blinds himself. What a lovely story. So as a port of reference, I just wanted to show you guys this timeline. Um, I want you to just look at the composers on the timeline. So um, you've got Purcell, who is the earliest. Um, then we've got Bach. So he, he wrote our Brandenburg Concerto, uh, which we study is another one of our set works. And then in the classical era, we have Beethoven and Beethoven actually writes our other instrumental set work and um, pathetic. So it's good to be able to visualize these composers and see where um, they come in comparison to others that we have studied. So Purcell is the earliest, and that's quite a good reference in terms of listening. So listening to what that really, really early um, sound actually sounds like. So like with most of our set works, it's really important to be able to comment on the uh, social historical context of the piece that you're studying. And as part of that, we have to be able to actually identify features of Baroque music itself. So in general. So we're going to make a couple of generalisations here. Um, so in Baroque music, there are several distinct characteristics. The first one is the use of a basso continuo. A basso continuo is a part given to instruments that play a bass line and chords to accompany a melody. Um, the performers normally improvise and decorate what they play. So in the Baroque period, instruments would have been um, the harpsichord, the bass viol um, and organ or lute. So in music for a while, we have the harpsichord, the bass viol, and the lute, which all are part of the basso continuo in this piece. Um, the harpsichord is a very important instrument in the Baroque period. It sounds a bit like this. This is a harpsichord. Okay, so it sounds um, very different to a piano, which would just sound like this. Okay, so very different sound, and the reason for that sound is that the um, the strings inside the instrument are actually plucked instead of hammered. So on pianos, um, they're hammered. Um, that's what makes the harpsichord sound a little bit um, tinnier as opposed to the piano, which sounds a bit more soft. Um, Unlike the piano, the harpsichord doesn't have a sustain pedal um, and playing dynamics wasn't possible. Um, the instrument just hadn't developed that far then. The bass viol is a large string instrument um, similar to the modern day cello. So that's the, the most alike instrument that we have today that we would compare to a bass viol. Um, in the exam, they might ask you what instrument is part of the basso continuo or, or a question similar and you would need to say bass file you would not get a mark for saying cello um, or double bass or just bass it needs to be bass file you need to remember that one so another feature is ornamentation so ornamentation is when extra notes are added to the melody to decorate it if you think of if you have a shelf and you put an ornament on it you're decorating it and that's exactly what ornamentation is um, in music, it's decorating a melody. It makes it sound a bit more impressive and a bit more complex. So there are lots of different um, examples of ornaments. So you might have a trill, which would sound like this, which is just a quick alternation between two notes. Um, you might have a mordant, which sounds like this, which is a really short trill. So a trill goes on for, for longer, a mordant might sound like this, like that. Okay, that's a mordant. Um, you might get more complex ones, but those are, are the most common that are used in Purcell. Um, and there are terraced dynamics. And terrace dynamics essentially means um, that where the instruments couldn't actually gradually change their 
volume, they were then forced to just have sudden changes. And I imagine, um, like on the screen, you can see a little skyline. You might be wondering why I put that there. The reason for that is I imagine a skyline. So you may get, might go along, there's a house, and then suddenly there's a skyscraper, and then it goes suddenly down. So I'm imagining that, that is like the volume of a piece. So it would maybe suddenly go loud, and then suddenly go back down. There was no diminuendos, there were no crescendos, so no gradual changes in um, dynamics, which was what made it difficult um, to be able to express. And that's why as we move through the eras, so classical, romantic, whilst the instruments were all being developed, that's why we then end up having gradual changes as opposed to sudden ones. So terrace dynamics in Baroque music. So I touched on this in the previous slide, but the instruments used in music for a while are as follows. So you, in the recording, we hear a soprano. Historically, women weren't allowed to perform um, as much as males. So it would have actually originally been a voice, which is a counter tenor voice, which means a high male voice. Um, but in the recording that we listen to, it is a soprano. So it's just good to know the historical um, context of why maybe we perform it as with sopranos, they would have performed it using a counter tenor. And then um, a bass viol, harpsichord and lute. The structure of music for a while is really easy to remember. So it is a da capo aria, which means that it's essentially an ABA form. So it's ternary form. And the main thing to remember about da capo arias is that the repeated A section tends to be slightly different. Um, and in this case, in music for a while, the slight difference is the fact that there's a little bit more ornamentation. Um, so those trills, those mordents in the melody, um, in the second A section. Melody. So word painting is used a lot in Purcell um, and word painting is when you have um, deliberate changes in the music to reflect what is actually going on in the text. So we often say that, that how, is the, how are the, are the, is the text set to music? Um, that's what the exam uh, board tends to say. So please describe how the text is set. Um, and that actually means, um, you know, is, is there any use of, of, of word painting in there? Is it syllabic? Is it melismatic? So syllabic being one word per syllable. So music, music, you know, all of those, they are all um, syllabic, whereas wandering and eternal, which I've used as word painting examples, are both melismatic, which means that there are multiple notes per syllable. So the example of eternal, eternal, that is melismatic because I'm using lots of different notes per syllable. If you think eternal has eternal, three syllables. So I've actually spread that out and I'm using loads of notes per those per three sy syllables. Um, so eternal is something that goes on forever. So that's why Purcell used melisma, because he wanted it to look like and sound like something that was going on forever. Um, most of the melody, apart from a few examples, is conjunct and syllabic. So conjunct means to go up in step and syllabic means one note per syllable. Syllabic is the opposite of melismatic. The interval between music and music is a perfect fifth. The melody uses ornamentation such as trills and mordents. We've done this one already. So trills and then mordents. Okay. Um, and the phrases are generally two or bars, two or four bars in length. So they're mostly even, and that is characteristic of Baroque music. Most of the time, um, they stick to even phrases, um, and that is significant um, for reasons which I will explain later on in this video. So, quick talk. If you're not ready for these questions, feel free to go back, rewind, have a look at the other slides. If you are ready, here we go. So, uh, what is a basso continuo? 
Is it a group of instruments, including the harpsichord, a melody played by the harpsichord, a part given to an instrument or instruments that plays a bass line and chords to accompany a melody? Is it, uh, what is the interval between the first music and the second music? Is it perfect fifth, perfect fourth, or an octave? And what does melismatic mean? Is it one note per syllable, more than one note per syllable, or a long note? So um, depending on how confident you are with those, just take a few seconds to answer, because I'm going to do the answers. So here we go. Um, the answer to A was a part given to instruments that play a bass line and chords to accompany a melody. The interval between music and music is perfect fifth. You need to make sure you say perfect fifth. And melismatic means more than one note per syllable. So rhythm and meter. Now, these are really simple to remember, a couple of these. Um, a few others are slightly more difficult to remember. So um, we'll start easy. So the piece uses common time. That basically means that the meter um, is 4-4. Four, four. So it's, it comes up as a C, but it means the same as 4-4. Four, four. There is no tempo marking, but it is a fairly slow pace. Um, we know that it's slow. It's going to be slow because it's an element. And one of the features of element is a slow pace because we want it to sound depressing. Um, the ground bass mostly plays quavers and semi-quavers. The texture of the piece is homophonic and we call it melody dominated homophony, but you can say homophonic. Melody dominated homophony means that you have a melody and a complement. Um, but homophony on its own is actually a bit more flexible. It might mean that you're just playing um, in chords a bit like this. So if I was just playing, this would be homophonic. That's homophonic because I'm doing, one line's doing this, the other line's doing this, but they're playing together. Um, if I had melody, melody dominated homophony, I'd have chords in my left hand and then a melody in my right hand. So that would be melody dominated homophony. So quiz, second quiz. Let's see how you're going to do. So if you're ready, amazing. If you're not, have a look at the slides. Here we go. What is the overall texture of the music? Homophonic, polyphonic or major? What's the time signature of the piece? Is it 3-4, 2-4 or 4-4? Four, four. And what note values do the ground bass use? Is it crotchets and quavers, quavers and minims or quavers and semi-quavers? Give yourself a couple of minutes to um, answer these. Just pause the video. Once you're ready, you can press play. Here are the answers. So the overall texture is homophonic. The time signature is 4-4. Four, four. And the values that the ground bass use are mostly quavers and semi-quavers. So well done. This is our last slide now. It's probably going to be one of the most difficult ones um, for you guys to get your head around. Harmony and tonality always is. Don't worry if you're stuck. I'll try and explain as well as I can. So the key of the piece is A minor. And the minor tonality reflects the mood. So remember, it's a lament. A minor key is one feature of a lament. Um, and the lament is, I've had a couple of people describe it as Baroque emo music. You know, we want it to be re sound really depressing. Um, and that's how we achieve that, one of the ways we achieve that. Another feature is the ground bass. So the ground bass is, is three bars long. And what that means is that because our melodies are mostly even phrases, it's going to be slightly off kilter. So I'm going to just do an example here for you. Um, so if I had my melody line, and I'm going to do one, two, three, four, so four bars long, we can see four bars long. And I'm going to do another four bars. Okay, so I've got two lots of four bars there. What will happen when I add my ground bass in is 
my first few might be in time, but then what will happen as I add my ground base in, so I'm just going to pop GB here. If I write one, two, three, the phrases aren't matching up and that might cause some dissonance. So dissonance is clashing of notes. So this is a really good way of being able to, to see how these dissonances might be created. So if I've got one melody playing here and I have this lovely ground bass, which is playing, I'm repeating this in uneven intervals and my melody is using even intervals. So it's going to sound a little bit different at certain bars and certain dissonances will be created because of that. So it actually enhances that um, uneasy feeling that we have because of those dissonances that are created by the ground bass. As well as that, in the ground bass, there are some chromatic notes. So if I play a chromatic scale for you, that's using all of the white and the black notes going up and down. So if I use something that's chromatic, that means that I'm using semitones, steps. Okay, so using chromatic notes com completely changes the mood. So if I was just using you know, a major scale, that sounds very different to a chromatic scale, which sounds a little bit more uneasy and uncertain. There's a clashing of notes on pains. So um, then there's a note D, a note E even, over a D minor chord, which sounds like this. You've got that E over this chord here. And that just sounds some dissonance on pain. So that's some word painting, which is actually created using harmony instead of melody. So we've got word painting on pain because there's dissonance there. And then we have a Ts de Picardy on snakes. A Ts de Picardy is where we have um, a major chord within a minor key. So um, you might have, if I was playing um, A minor. And then suddenly go, that is a T.S. de Picardy because that sounds very out of place and it's on snakes specifically. And then there might be a question on that. They might say, describe the harmony on snakes. Um, and you can either put there is a major chord or there is a T.S. de Picardy. Um, T.S. de Picardy is much more specific than just a major chord. So I would really recommend that you use that term as opposed to major chord. But you would get a mark for either. So that's the end of our video on music for a while. I hope this helps with all your home learning and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Bye.